Hi, this is Dinesh, working as a project officer in Geotechnical Engineering Division at IIT Madras. It's my pleasure to offer a guest lecture for the course of FE and Constitutive Modeling in Geomechanics. I would like to deliver my lecture on the topic of simulation of soil liquefaction using FLAC. The outline of presentation is like this. So, a brief inter intro for FLAC followed by soil liquefaction and then how to characterize the cyclic loading resistance of sand and the dependency of sand on trust dependent behavior of sand and the critical state framework to incorporate such stress dependent behavior of sand and more importantly the bounding surface model which is the topic of uh, discussion today which is to be used for simulation of soil liquefaction in FLAC. So one of such bounding surface model is PM4 sand model it would be discussed in this lecture and the calibration of PM4 sand model to Nevada sand and finally the simulation of a boundary value problem which is an embankment uh, resting on a liquefiable foundation soil. So, coming to flag, it is a finite difference program. So, in this the governing differential equations are replaced by algebraic expressions. So, the stresses and displacements, the quantities of interest are obtained at discrete points in space. So, the stresses and displacements are undefined within the elements. So, which means normally in case of finite element the stresses and displacements will vary over the element because the shear functions are defined over there. So, whereas here the equations are solved at the node and there is no interpolation over the element. It is the interaction between the nodes. The geometric domain of the body or soil material is discretized in flak using in flak 2D using quadrilateral element. So, it can be seen that the quadrilateral elements are made of two triangular elements and each quadrilateral elements are not used, each quadrilateral elements are composed of a, an overlay. So, two quadrilateral elements are overlaid each, overlaid. The quadrilateral elements are made of triangular elements, a pair of overlaid quadrilateral elements are used to discretize the body in flag and each quadrilateral element is made of two triangular elements. This particular form is called mixed discretization. This is done to, this is done in flag to have a, to have a, this is done in flag to the geometric domain of the body in flag is discretized using quadrilateral element. Each quadrilateral is made of two triangular elements. The quadrilateral elements are not used in a not just a single quadrilateral element. It is instead a overlaid set of quadrilateral elements are used to represent each element. So, this particular form is called mixed discretization. So, this enables accurate prediction of plastic collapse load, it avoids volumetric locking and the hourglass deformation can also be averted. So, basically in flag the strain increments are applied and the nodal velocities are derived by solving the equilibrium equations. So, these nodal velocities are further converted into these nodal velocities are further converted into strain rates. These strain rates are used by the equilibrium equations to get the new set of stresses. So, this is the typical uh, a cycle of calculation that is followed in flag. So, basically the strain increment is applied to obtain the stress increment. Flag adopts explicit scheme. So, here so the time step is very smaller when compared to the implicit case because the equations are solved at every time step. So, it is not that something the iteration that happens in finite elements in case of implicit schemes is not done over here. So, this reduces the computational effort and here the no iterations are necessary in case of explicit 
and since the matrices since the elemental equations are not formed so the matrices are also matrix since the elemental equations are not formed over here the matrices are not used so which in turn reduces significant computation time so whereas in case of implicit the elemental equations are formed global equations and they are iterated further to achieve the desired tolerable solution desired tolerance for the solution so this reduces the computation time in case of explicit so explicit can also handle the nonlinear problems in a robust way it can accommodate larger strains as well to put it up briefly so the finite difference converts the differential equations into equivalent algebraic form and the explicit scheme is adopted here it is incremental because the problem of interest here it is not it is non linear problem it is but it is iterative the explicit integration is adopted over here explicit scheme is used in flag so it is incremental but not iterative it is incremental because it is a non linear form non linear stress strain relationship that is to be ad adapted for the soil material so it uses the newton central difference scheme and it is a lagrangian so in case of lagrangian so the model in case of lagrangian the nodal deformations in case of lagrangian the nodal displacements are updated and the grid deforms along with the material that it represents and as explained earlier so the mixed discretization scheme is adopted over here in which the quadrilateral elements are overlaid over each other and each quadrilateral elements are made of two triangular elements and this particular uh, program can accommodate larger strains and fully coupled mode this is most important aspect in case of liquefaction wherein the volumetric changes due to shear loading and also the flow of water during such loading both are equally important so this fully coupled mode can be performed in flag so it obviously uses smaller time step and because of which the stability can be ensured and the pore water pressure is computed in flag based on the volumetric strains and the constitutive models used are effective stress models so both 2d and 3d programs are available so this is particularly very useful for soil and rock modeling and it supports the user defined material models anyone can develop a new constitutive model and it can be implemented in flag so that is what it is user defined models so it can predict the plastic collapse load as a result of mixed discretization scheme that is used in flag and solid fluid coupling so both mechanical and pore water soil solid fluid so fully coupled simulations are possible because flag allows such options and indeed it is robust and it can simulate the non linear the non linear loss can be easily the non linear material behavior can be simulated using flag and it can accommodate large strains so the drainage conditions are very important for modeling soil liquefaction whether it could be undrained or drained or fully coupled so undrained and drained are the idealized cases but fully coupled is the more relevant more realistic fully coupled is the more realistic drainage condition and fully coupled effective stress analysis is possible in flag so the pore, so the pore pore pressure generation and dissipation can be captured so when the soil experiences the shear loading the pore water pressure increases because the soil exhibits a contractive behavior and as the pore water dissipates as a result of the permeability of the soil and the drainage function the inherent drainage function so the effective stress increases 
So both the reduction in effective stress due to the generation of pore water pressure and the increase in effective stress as a result of dissipation of pore water pressure both are equally important to simulate the soil liquefaction. So such solid fluid interaction is possible over here. So the mechanical volume changes that leads to the increase in excess pore pressure. This leads to the reduction in effective stress. At the same time, the pore water pressure also dissipates as a function of the drainage possibility. And that allows to recover the strength and stiffness of the soil. Apart from this, FLAC also has an inbuilt programming language called FISH. So it has simple syntaxes. So these the scripts that are developed using FISH can be used to execute the analysis or you can compute the additional quantities. So for instance, excess pore pressure ratio which is of a key indicator for soil liquefaction. So it is not a direct quantity that can be obtained in FLAC from the menu. So the functions can be used to obtain the RU, the excess pore pressure ratio and more importantly the user defined constitutive models. So that can be developed using the FISH program. So coming to the topic of discussion today, liquefaction. So the saturated granular soil experiences liquefaction when it is subjected to cyclic shear loading. This occurs during earthquake. So what happens is due to the quick nature of earthquake loading, so the water present in the soil pores so experiences the pressure and this pore pressure could not be dissipated easily because the earthquake loading is very quick. So this leads to the accumulation of excess pore water pressure. So altogether this excess pore pressure develops due to the contractive behavior of soil that is the way how it responds to the cyclic shear loading. And once this excess pore pressure reaches the initial effective stress of soil, so the soil is said to have no strength and stiffness, so which is the fluidized state of soil. So such liquefaction has caused a devastating damages in the past. For instance, the Nevada, for instance, Niigata earthquake in 1964 caused the damage to the buildings and the failure of dam is visible, failure of uh, bridge structure and damages to the ha harbor. So these are all as a result of liquefaction. So the consequence of liquefaction is catastrophic. Coming to the mechanism of liquefaction, so the cyclic shear loading causes the increase in pore water pressure. You can see the water present between the soil particles and here in this case there is a contact between the soil grains. When the load is applied as a result of which as a result of it pore pressure increases and it leads to the loss of contact between the particles. So it is known that the sand derives its strength and stiffness based on the contact between the soil particles. So once the contact is lost, so it's it's no longer support the structure. To analyze the liquefaction, the cyclic stress approach is the simplest approach. It is developed by Seed and Idris. So this enables the comparison of the cyclic shear loading as well as the resistance of sand to cyclic shear loading. We know that the, the earthquake loading has a loading cycles which is non-uniform in nature. It is quite irregular. So its amplitude varies continuously. But such kind of loading cannot be used directly in the lab to simulate the liquefaction. So it is necessary to convert the irregular loading cycles into equivalent uniform loading cycles. So this earthquake loading and the sinusoidal loading plotted over here is not for scale. So it is just meant for illustration purpose. The cyclic shear loading is characterized in terms of CSR. 
cyclic stress ratio. It is the ratio of uniform cyclic shear stress to initial effective stress of soil. So, the CSR varies with respect to the kind of test that we perform. In case of cyclic triaxial, so the CSR is the ratio of the deviatoric stress to the confining stress. In case of cyclic direct simple shear, the CSR is defined as a ratio of cyclic shear stress to initial vertical effective stress. So, it depends upon the loading conditions in the test that we adopt. And this is about the loading applied to the soil element through the laboratory tests. But coming to the characterization of the liquefaction resistance of sand that is made in terms of cyclic resistance ratio CRR. So, CRR is nothing but the CSR that is the cyclic stress ratio required to cause liquefaction at an applied uniform loading cycles. The number of uniform loading cycles coming to the assessment of the liquefaction resistance of sand that is the cyclic resistance. So, that is made in terms of CRR cyclic resistance ratio. CRR is the cyclic stress ratio required to cause liquefaction at a specified number of uniform loading cycles. So, it has to be noted that it is uniform number of loading cycles because in laboratory we can only apply the uniform loading cycles. So, normally the number of cycles is kept as 15. So, this 15 corresponds to the magnitude of earthquake of 7.5 and this both 15 and 7.5 are based on this particular aspect because the reference stress level chosen over here is 65 percentage of the peak shear stress amplitude. So, what is done is the for a given earthquake motion the peak amplitude is considered and 65 percentage of that amplitude is chosen and the uniform loading cycles of that amplitude that is the 65 percentage of peak amplitude is applied to simulate the loading in laboratory. So, the definition of CRR varies with respect to the laboratory test and the failure criteria. So, how it is said to be to define the occurrence of liquefaction, the criteria are based on both shear strain and as well as excess pore pressure ratio. It is either 3 percent shear strain or excess pore pressure ratio of 0.98. So, the excess pore pressure ratio R is RU is an important quantity, a key indicator of liquefaction. So, it is defined as the ratio of excess pore water pressure to the initial vertical effective stress. And apart from the laboratory tests, so the cyclic liquefaction resistance can also be ascertained from the field as well. So, it is standard penetration test, cone penetration test and dilutometer test can also be the data from these tests also enable us to determine the cyclic resistance of sand. This is beyond the scope of this particular lecture. So, coming to the simulation of liquefaction in element tests in laboratory. So, the most performed tests are cyclic triaxial, cyclic direct simple shear and cyclic torsional tests. So, various researchers have contributed for this particular aspect. And the key phenomena that are associated with liquefaction are cyclic mobility, flow liquefaction and lateral spreading. These phenomena occur at different soil conditions depending on the, the, the behavior of soil to the shear loading. For instance, cyclic mobility occurs in a soil which exhibits strain hardening response to the shear loading and flow liquefaction happens in case of the soil if it exhibits a softening behavior under monotonic loading and lateral spreading is possible in mostly in cases of sloping ground where static shear stress is predominant. Here in this lecture it is all about the cyclic mobility. So, here the typical the response of sand to cyclic simple shear loading is plotted here. Firstly the stress strain response can be seen. For initial loading cycles, the soil behavior is stiff 
and as the as the loading progresses you can see the strain accumulates with increasing number of loading cycles and this is evident from the stress path plot as well so this is the initial state and as the loading is applied the effective stresses decreases progressively due to the generation of pore water pressure and finally the typical butterfly loop is apparent over here which is a typical behavior that is it's a typical cyclic mobility behavior of sand the behavior of sand is stress dependent so the stress dependency is based on three factors relative density confining stress and static shear stress so here it is seen that the variation of cyclic shear stress ratio crr here it is 10 cycles is considered so as i mentioned earlier it depends upon the the stress level that we choose so here crr is defined as number of uniform loading cycles required to cause 3% shear strain that is inferred as liquefaction in 10 number of loading cycles on the other hand it is plotted against the consolidation stress so for relative density the influence of relative density can be seen here the with the increase in relative density for any given confining pressure it can be seen that the crr increases so this is the influence of relative density on cyclic resistance of sand when it comes to the influence of confining stress it can be seen that for a given relative density the cyclic resistance decreases with increase in confining stress so these are important aspects that are to be accounted to simulate the soil liquefaction normally a correction factor is applied to incorporate the influence of the confining stress so the reduction factor k sigma is defined as the ratio of the cyclic resistance ratio at any confining stress to the cyclic resistance ratio at a confining stress of 100 kpa Th through this the effect of confining stress can be represented on the cyclic resistance ratio so in order to represent the stress dependent behavior of sand it is necessary to invoke the principles of critical state so the the main future of critical state is it enables to use a single set of model parameters to represent the soil behavior over a range of initial states that is at different relative densities and confining stress so the critical state begins with the state parameter it is the difference of current void ratio from the critical state void ratio here the relative state parameter index is focused over here which is based on the boltons dilatancy relationship here it can be seen that the critical state line plotted in void ratio and mean effective stress plot so this is a representation of density and this is a representation of confining stress so if the critical state can be incorporated into the model so the soil behavior at any given stress state can be simulated here the relative state parameter index is derived in terms of the relative density which is the difference of critical state relative density to the current relative density so the drcs in turn is obtained as obtained in terms of the in, the initial vertical effective stress and the other unknown parameter is q it's a empirical constant it is based on boltons dilatancy index so this particular critical state framework is essentially an empirical one so with different q values the trends of zr with respect to 
CRR is observed over here for two different testing conditions. One is cyclic traction, the other one is the simple shear. Apart from relative density and confining stress, the other prominent factor is the static shear stress. So, this is the influence of this particular parameter is very much dominant in case of sloping soils. So, static bias is defined as the ratio of static shear stress to initial vertical effective stress or confining stress. This also has a prominent influence on the cyclic resistance. So, that is apparent from the plot over here. This plot is the static shear stress ratio alpha versus the CRR cyclic resistance ratio. It can be it varies for with respect to relative density for a 50 percent relative density there is not much of a effect of static shear stress on CRR. But in case of 68 percentage of relative density. So, the CRR increases with alpha and when it comes to the confining stress, so contradictory responses, contradictory trends are evident with respect to confining stress as well. So, for higher confining stress, the CRR is found to decrease with respect to alpha. On the other hand, for a lower confining stresses, the CRR increases with respect to alpha. So, these trends are basically from the laboratory experiments performed by various researchers. So, these has to be embodied into the constitutive model if the sand behavior is to be represented appropriately so that the liquefaction can be simulated realistically. So, for this purpose, the relative state parameter index that is which is previously dis discussed which is uh, which for which paves the way for the critical state framework for this particular case. It can be seen that the Zyr is capable of capturing the trends exhibited by sand for different static shear stress ratio and it is the correction factor over here k alpha it is the cyclic resistance ratio at any static shear stress to the cyclic resistance ratio when there is no static bias. So, this particular trends indicate that the Zyr, the relative state parameter index can capture the effect of static shear stress on the cyclic resistance of sand. Coming to the constitutive modeling for simulating soil liquefaction, here the bounding surface plasticity model is focused in this lecture. The concept of bounding surface plasticity was developed by Dafalias in 1975. This is a bit different from the classical elastoplasticity models. Here the bounding surface is present and an yield surface is present. So, if the stress rate lies within this smaller yield surface, the behavior is elastic and once the stress rate exceeds this yield surface, so the plastic straining occurs and the stress rate is bounded within this surface. So, it is for a reason it is bounding surface. So, the stress rate cannot exceed the bounding surface. So, when the stress rate lies on the bounding surface and if the material is loaded, so it exhibits elastoplastic behavior. So, which is typically a conventional yield surface. But the main future of this model is it can simulate plasticity when the stress rate exceeds this inner yield surface during loading itself. But in classical elastoplasticity models, so if the loading happens within the yield surface, so the behavior is said to be elastic. So, 
in order to capture the plasticity behavior a smaller yield surface is defined and the stress states are bounded by a much larger surface that is the bounding surface and the cyclic loading can be simulated through this the loading and unloading unloading is elastic in this case so during loading itself i mean the during loading within the bounding surface can represent the plastic strain as well so this plastic strain is governed by the plastic modulus so that is a function of distance between the current stress state and its image point on the bounding surface so for instance so the sigma not dash is the point on the yield surface and this particular point is its projection on the bounding surface so the directly the distance between these two points governs the plastic modulus and as the this distance decreases the plastic modulus decreases so this enables the continuous variation of plastic modulus and it enables this particular framework very much suitable to simulate the cyclic loading so pm4 sand model is from the family of bounding surface model here in addition to the bounding surface this model is a critical critical state compatible model so to define the material behavior the critical state principles are invoked so that the material parameters can be used to represent the soil behavior over a range of stresses and other than critical state the direct and sea surface is also present so this surface enables the transition in soil behavior if if the soil if the stress state remains within 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 the direct and sea surface so the behavior is contractive and when it crosses this direct and sea surface the the behavior becomes dilative so this direct and sea line is identical to the phase transformation line proposed by ishihara so which is basically the transition in volumetric behavior from contractive to dilative so here in line with the discussed bounding surface concept so a smaller yield surface is present over here and the behavior is elastic within this yield surface and this yield surface can translate in the stress space so that is called kinematic hardening so this yield surface can either it can translate as well as it can expand or contract in size so here only the translation is considered so the kinematic hardening occurs over here and the plastic modulus is computed as a distance based on the plastic modulus is computed in terms of the distance between the stress point on the yield surface and its projection on the bounding surface the image point so for this purpose the alpha b alpha d so these are the measure of distances from the current stress point so this in turn allows to compute the alpha b allows to compute the plastic modulus so it is essentially a stress ratio controlled constitutive model so the stress ratio is it is the ratio of shear stresses to mean effective stress so the mean effective stress decreases progressively due to the applied loading cycles because the pore pressure increases so the stress ratio is said to increase and it increases forth and back because it is a cyclic loading so the possibility of capturing the plastic strains within the bounding surface allows to capture the response of sand to the cyclic loading so this is the concept behind the pm4 sand model and it can be seen here 
this bounding surface, dilatancy surface and critical state surface, they are all defined as a function of the relative state parameter. So, which was discussed earlier. So, this xi r can account for the effect of confining stress and effect of static shear stress on the relative density. This xi r can account for the effect of static shear bias and the overburden stress on the cyclic resistance ratio. And this critical state is defined with the critical state friction angle. The other important aspect present in the PM4 sand model is the fabric variable. It is a damage index. So, this fabric variable evolves when the stress rate exceeds the dilatancy surface. Because the dilatancy, the dilative behavior of soil leads to the changes in orientation of the soil particle. So, once the stress rate comes back from dilation to the contraction, so the contraction gets enhanced. So, to, en to capture this enhanced contraction, the fabric variable is used in this model and it is made as a function of plastic shear strain. This PM4 sand model is available as a user defined constitutive model in flag 2D and it is limited to plain strain conditions as of now. Here Nevada sand is chosen as a material to simulate in flag using the PM4 sand model and with respect to different relative density these are the values of shear modulus, maximum shear modulus, dry density and permeability, the void ratio maximum and minimum values for Nevada sand. It is inferred from the literature and the properties of embankment that is constructed over the liquefiable sand is said to have the shown properties maximum shear modulus of 20 mega Pascal and dry density of 1630 cohesion of 22 kPa and phi CV of 31. To calibrate the PM4 sand model to Nevada sand, a series of cyclic simple shear simulations, a single element simulation of cyclic simple shear loading was conducted. So, this shows the boundary conditions adopted. So, the base of the element is fixed and the top nodes of the element are attached so that it experiences the same amount of deformation. So, this is a typical boundary conditions that are prescribing the cyclic simple shear loading. The loading is applied in the lateral direction in the top surface of the specimen. So, these simulations are performed with a different set of model constants and these are the final set of model constants that are arrived based on the calibration performed. So, the PM4 sand model has three primary parameters that is G0 which is a representative of elastic shear modulus, HP0 this governs the contraction rate of sand, this H0 is a is a parameter to represent the plastic modulus and this can be obtained from the data of resonant column test which is performed for different strain levels and NB and ND are the model constants. NB represents the bounding surface, ND for dilatancy surface so which was defined earlier as can be seen NB and ND over here. These are the parameter parameters input parameters to make the surface in the constitutive model and Q and R are the Bolton's dilatancy parameters. So, these are empirical constants for a material and so by choosing a set of model constants listed in the table shown previously these are the plots that are obtained for different relative densities say for this one is this this plot corresponds to 40% relative density 
can be seen that the experimental data are sourced from the literature from various researchers and the current study plot is here so the present study so by establishing a, a plot between the relationship between the number of uniform loading cycles required to reach 3% shear strain against the applied the calibration is performed by having a series of simulations unit element simulations of cyclic simple shear loading here the number of uniform loading cycles required to reach 3% shear strain is plotted against the cyclic stress ratio that is the loading applied to represent the the shear loading so this expression y equal to 0.9 into x raised to minus 0.31 so this 0.31 is a factor so this indicates the the calibration of pm4 sand model to nevada sand was performed by conducting a series of unit element simulations and the corresponding plot is here it can be seen the data points from various sources from literature for 40% relative density is plotted over here it is the number of uniform loading cycles to reach 3% shear strain that is liquefaction versus the applied cyclic stress ratio and this is the plot obtained and for 90% relative density so this is the plot that are obtained so the element responses the response of the calibrated element single element is compared with the respective experimental data the experimental data is sourced from adelier et al 1992 the experimental data is sourced from the laboratory data of arulmoli et al 1992 it can be seen the stress strain behavior comparison first so here the model captures the progressive accumulation of shear strains with increase in number of loading cycles when it comes to the stress path response a typical butterfly loop is captured and the increase in pore water pressure with respect to shear strain is also captured so coming to the boundary value case which is simulated in flag that is the loose foundation deposit that is the liquefiable deposit supporting an embankment clay embankment so this model is subjected to three different shaking events they are harmonic in nature so their amplitudes of 0.1g 0.2g and 0.3g so each has 10 cycles and the frequency of 0.16 hertz here the nodes of the left boundary is attached to the right boundaries to simulate the uh, one directional shear beam loading it's a common boundary condition adopted to simulate the cyclic loading of uh, soil deposit so the predicted the computed excess pore water pressure is plotted against the experimental data here it can be seen the locations three vertical array of uh, pore pressure transducers are considered here so these are the locations where the experimental data is available and the pore pressure for these locations this is p9 p6 p3 corresponds to the locations below the center of embankment p8 p5 p2 corresponds to the soil deposit lying below the toe of embankment and this p7 p4 and p1 represents the far field case so it can be seen that for far field case 
reasonable agreement exists between the computed excess pore pressure ratio and the measured excess pore pressure ratio. And when it comes to the foundation location below the toe of embankment, it can be seen the computed excess pore pressure is largely over predicted. The same trend is reflected at location below the center of embankment as well. So, apart from the individual pore pressure plots, to gain additional insights, the contours are plotted here. It can be seen that this is the excess pore pressure ratio contours, maximum value of excess pore pressure ratio. It can be seen that the far field region completely liquefied and the soil below the embankment also reaches liquefaction and only a, a certain region below the embankment is still away from liquefaction. This corresponds to the shaking 2 event and for shake 3 event it can be seen that it is like the further the soil below the embankment reaches liquefaction. So here this is reported as class C prediction. So it is this prediction is nothing but it is undertaken when the experimental data is available to the modeler already. So that is categorized it is categorized as class C liquefaction. It is categorized as class C simulation. So the discrepancy in computed excess pore water pressure at the central foundation region is attributed to shear induced dilation. So here the lateral displacement contour is shown here. So here it can be seen that the soil below the toe of embankment experiences large lateral deformations in both the in both the sides. So this leads to the dilation of soil over here as soil moves laterally in this direction in the horizontal direction under both the toes. So the soil below this region experiences dilation. So this dilation is responsible for preserving the strength and stiffness of the soil deposit that is lying below the embankment. So that is what the most literature has attributed to. But the predicted excess pore pressures are high. But the pore pressures are over predicted by the numerical model developed. And in another instance, the pore water flow vectors are shown here. It can be seen that the vectors points upwards. So this is the dissipation of excess pore water pressure. And here in this region, it can be seen that the vectors are pointing towards inward direction as opposed to the outward direction. So this is said to be the dilation. But the dilation occurs but not to a necessary level so that the whatever the experimental data could not be uh, predicted by the developed numerical model. For this class C1 simulations were performed. So what are these classes of predictions are class A, class B, class C and class C1. Class A is a blind prediction. So the computation is done prior to the experiment and class B is done after the experiment but the results are not known to the to the modeler who conducts the simulation. And class C case represents that the experimental results are known by the person who is undertaking the numerical simulations. And class C1 is, is a particular case where the soil model parameters are adjusted to improve the quality of the predictions. So in this case, uh, 
class C simulations were performed by adjusting the model constants NB which governs the uh, bounding surface in turn the NB governs the bounding surface, ND governs the dilatancy surface and HP0 is the contraction rate parameter. So these values were changed for class C1 prediction because this NB and ND are adjusted so that the dilation is said to occur earlier than what it actually predicted before in order to improve the simulation. So for this the class C parameters were switched to class C1 parameters and the HP0 for both staking event were kept same. In fact all these parameters were same for both shake 2 and shake 3 event. Following the shake 1 event, the sh since the shaking event 1 is of smaller amplitude, it did not lead to liquefaction. So that is why the results of shaking 1 are not included here. For class C1 predictions, again the element simulations were conducted and it is plotted over here. So it can be seen that this is the bold line corresponds to class C case, the dotted line corresponds to class C1. So from this plot, it can be seen that the cyclic resistance that are represented by class C1 case is higher than the class C case. So which is the response that is indeed for class C1 simulation. So now the computed excess pore pressure ratio for both class C prediction and class C1 prediction are compared with the experimental result. So it can be seen that now the excess pore pressure shows a better match. The computed excess pore pressure so shows a better match to the experimental results. So it is about class C1 prediction and it can be seen that in case of class C1 prediction, so the here it has the response had improved slightly but still the soil has liquefied in this region but not like the case that was seen for class C1, not like the case that was shown for class C can be seen here over here and the deformation plots are compared over here. It is corresponds to the C1 prediction and the Adelier at all 1998 corresponds to the experimental data. So it can be seen that the numerical model had over predicted the displacements vertical settlement and it has under predicted uh, the heave over here and this lateral displacements are also over predicted. Other than class C1 considerations, cons uh, other than considering class C1 simulations, uh, temporal variation of soil permeability is also considered as an option. So for this, uh, the relationship proposed by Shahir et al. 2014 was chosen. So in this case, the soil permeability is made to increase as with respect to the excess pore pressure ratio RU. So as RU increases which means that the soil approaches liquefaction. So as we know that the soil particle loses contact so it is uh, it is it can be the increase in permeability can be justified and in fact that has been suggested by several researchers as well. So that has been incorporated in this numerical model and the respective plots are shown here. So it can be the alpha k corresponds to the factor by which the permeability is increased. So maximum value of alpha k chosen here is 10. So it can be seen that for alpha k 1 it can be seen that the excess pore pressure are lower 
and as you increase the permeability say for this case it is 3 and for 5 and for all the increments so the excess pore pressure ratio increases when compared to alpha k equal to 1. On the other hand it can be seen that the plot for class C1 is also included here which is based on the adjusted dilatancy parameters. So this shows the lower pore water pressure ratio. So from this exercise it is found that the increase in permeability will lead to the increase in excess pore pressure ratio computed. It is because the soil in the free field region liquefies first and once the permeability of the soil is increased so obviously pore water can come out of from the central region towards the far field. So this inhibits the dilation. So that in turn leads to increase in the excess pore pressure that are computed below the center of the embankment. This is also reflected in terms of reflected in the shear strain plots, stress strain plots. So where it can be seen that P4 corresponds to the free field, P5 corresponds to below the toe of embankment and P6 corresponds to center of the embankment. It can be seen that for these cases, these are the ones that correspond to class C and the right hand side it is class C1. So there is not much change, much difference in case of the free field scenario and for the case of 2 also there is not much difference but when it comes to below the center of the embankment so it can be seen that some dilation is apparent in class C1 prediction when compared to class C prediction. So this implies the difference between the class C and class C1 predictions that were performed in this study. This is also demonstrated with the help of vertical effective stress. So this element calibration, so this corresponds to class C case. So these contours are the ones that were obtained following the dissipation of excess pore water pressure that were generated as a result of application of shaking event 2. So here it can be seen that the effective stresses did not recover completely here in class C case and when the permeability of the soil is varied further discrepancy was observed. It is in fact worse than this case class C case and when it comes to the modified dilatancy parameters this is the class C1 case it can be seen that the effective stresses are required or recovered to the levels that are actually expected. So this summarizes the class C case and the variable permeability case and class C1 case. So summary of this lecture is the liquid basic aspects of liquefaction, the cyclic resistance of sand and the element calibration of uh, constitutive model to uh, Nevada sand was discussed and the overview of flag program was provided, the use of bounding surface model that is the PM4 sand model to simulate liquefaction was demonstrated with the case of a boundary value problem that is an embankment resting over a foundation soil. Thank you.